Hello, my friends. It's good to see you again, even if only through the computer screen. I trust that you and your family and your loved ones are well in these uncertain days. Over here at our place, and I'm sitting in our backyard right now, trying to finish this message before the sun goes down. Over at our place, we are doing well. You probably recall I reported to you that our son, Nick, who is 21, contracted COVID-19 recently, but he had the grace to, uh, well, not share it with anyone else in the family. He just kept it to himself, and we are thankful for that. He had a relatively mild case, is fully recovered now, certainly not contagious or anything. And so we are very thankful that he came through that well. We continue to pray for you, that you and your loved ones will come through. We pray for a return to some semblance of normalcy once we get past this pandemic. Of course, for that to happen, all of us need to take the precautions that the medical leaders, scientists, and physicians have, are telling us about every day. It's the same ones of wearing a mask, washing our hands frequently, and maintaining physical distance, which is a better term than social distance. I guess social distancing could sort of imply a rejection of a person or treating them like a leper, you know, wouldn't touch that person with a 10-foot pole or at least a 6-foot pole. Physical distancing is different. It's just saying, hey, you know, for the sake of each of us, for the sake of all of us, let's do it this way so that we reduce the spread of this often deadly virus. So keep doing what you're doing. We will keep praying for you. And we look forward to the possibility it, it remains only a possibility, but it's one that we are aiming for, the possibility of reopening or resuming our regular worship activities at Church of the Redeemer on Sunday, the 13th of September. That's not very far off. I know on the one hand, it seems like, wow, that's a long time to wait. But in the scheme of things and in terms of, of staying healthy and acting in ways that bless and benefit our neighbors, it's just a very short time, and it is a small sacrifice. And so I ask you not to give up on us. We've not forgotten about you. We are not avoiding you. We very much want to be back together. I can certainly say that for myself, and I know that I can say that for each of my fellow elders on the session. We want to be back together but we are waiting, we are moving with caution because the most basic principle in our decision-making is to honor Christ by obeying his highest commandment, that we love God with all of our hearts and that we love our neighbors as ourselves. That's what Jesus told the scribes and Pharisees when they tried to trick him, asking him what the greatest commandment was. That's the answer that he gave. And I, I mentioned that piece of it because the text I want to share with you from tonight involves another example of the scribes and Pharisees trying to trip up Jesus so that they could hang a charge on him that he is being unfaithful to Scripture or that he's a heretic, anything that they might get to get a leg up on him, if you will. So um, we'll get to that in just a moment. Um, I just want to encourage you to, as I say, hang in there. Don't give up on us. Don't give up on yourself. Um, we will be together again. But for now, the best medical sources, the scientists and the physicians, continue to tell us that it is best for groups of people not to meet in person. Now, the one exception to that is if people wearing masks and maintaining physical distancing meet outside, then the risk of spreading infection is greatly reduced. It doesn't go down to zero, but it is much safer than meeting indoors. <clears throat> And so Pat Thompson has been hosting folks 
on her very pleasant back patio every Sunday morning and uh, sharing Bible study and, and people are sharing their thoughts and their ideas and it's been very meaningful for the people who've been there. And uh, I encourage you to consider joining that group of folks that is meeting next Sunday. Um, I look forward to being present and uh, that is in Pat's backyard. And so if you haven't come before now, um, at least come then. Better yet, you know, hope you're there tomorrow morning. But um, I will be there the first Sunday of August, and I hope that you will be too. It would be wonderful to see you again, and we can even pretend to shake hands. We can even pretend to hug. For now, consider yourself hugged in the Spirit. Consider your hand to be vigorously shaken in the Spirit, because I am really glad to, well, at least sort of, see you. You can see me even though I can't see you. So today I'm giving you a little bit different backdrop than usual. I'm outdoors now. And so you get to see a bit of God's creation in the background instead of just pictures on the wall of my office. Now, um, to share from Scripture, um, I want to begin with 1 John chapter 2, a few verses, and then we will go back to the Gospel of John and... And we will discover together a remarkable connection between these two books. Now, of course, there is an organic connection between them in that they were written by the same person. And we have no reason to believe that it was not John the Apostle, one of the original 12 disciples, that person himself who wrote the book. There are some books of the New Testament that we believe may have been written by unknown person or per, an unknown person or persons and then um, assigned the name of a famous apostle so as to give what is written more authority to give it a, a sort of legitimacy but john's gospel and the epistles of john so far as we know are written by the same person and that person is the man john himself 1 John chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of the Lord. Now, I want to just go back and um, share basically some linguistic insights with you. So John is writing to all Christians. First, second, and third John are what we call general epistles. And that term simply means that they were written for the, for the general audience, if you will. In other words, not addressed to a particular congregation like, say, Paul's letters were. Paul's letters and their original audience, of course, are identified by the names of the cities where those congregations were. So 1st and 2nd Corinthians were written to the Christians in Corinth, to the congregation that Paul had founded there. And the letter to the Philippians in the same way is written to Christians in Philippi, which was a city in Macedonia. It is the place where the gospel reached the continent of Europe for the very first time. But that is a wonderful story for a different day. The general epistles, like John's letters, are written to the whole church, applicable to all. My little children. And so John conceives of himself as father, as a shepherd figure. And that, of course, he is. He is by this time, perhaps, at the time of writing, the sole surviving member of the original band of 12 disciples. I'm writing, writing these things to you so that you may not sin. 
But, and, and then he recognizes reality that we are going to, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. And just quickly, this word advocate is a, a very interesting one. The primary meaning is that is, is the same way that we use the word today. One of the uses that we have for advocate today is that a defense attorney is an advocate or a counselor. Um, and that's what Jesus is. He is our defense counsel. He is our advocate. He is the chief public defender in the courts of heaven. Now, Scripture also says that Jesus himself is our judge. So that presents an interesting scenario, doesn't it? Jesus is our judge, and Jesus is the chief public defender or the lead defense counsel on our team, on our behalf. And, of course, he offers those services pro bono, free of charge. You can't pay for the defense that Jesus makes on your behalf. You can only receive it as a gift. So if Jesus is the judge on this one hand, and he is the chief defense counsel on the other hand, which side or whose side do you suppose that the judge is going to come down on? Jesus is not schizophrenic after all. He is one person of sound mind. He is both, but he has two jobs, judge and defense counsel. So I think you can be confident in what the outcome will be when Jesus is both the judge and or the defense counsel. He's going to come down on your side if you hadn't already figured that out. So we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And this is an important term, this descriptor for Jesus, the righteous. It simply means one who has standing before God because he is without sin. He is perfect. He is already in right relationship with God. And John says the same thing in the next chapter of the first epistle of John. 1 John chapter 3, verse 5 says, You know that Jesus was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Okay, so I want you to keep that phrase in mind for the next few minutes. In him there is no sin. That is to say, he is the righteous one. So it is Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, which means in a phrase that Jesus has already paid the price. He has accepted the penalty for our sin. He's taken the punishment in his own body. And that work is done. When Jesus was hanging on the cross and gasped out those words, it is finished. He was referring to the work of salvation. He has taken the punishment in his own body so that we do not have to receive it. The record is cleared. That is to say, our record. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And get this, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, I could go on all night can't do that though if I do that you won't even be able to see me because the sun will be completely gone but anyway not for our sins only but also for the sin of the whole world you know that means among other things that classical Calvinism is wrong in this one respect classical Calvinism postulates as one of the five tenets of so-called tulip theology that um, Jesus um, that G the work of Jesus accomplished a limited atonement. That is the L in tulip, limited atonement. And limited atonement is a phrase that means that Jesus died for the sins of those who believe in him and accept his lordship in their lives. 
actually this notion of accepting the Lordship of Christ or accepting him as your Savior and Lord is not a concept that Calvin ever thought about or knew of. It's not in Scripture. It was invented in the 20th century, and it has some value, but um, it can also be problematic if we build whole uh, cases or schools of doctrine on it when it doesn't even appear in Scripture. And so to say that's the sole um, means of salvation, that you say a sinner's prayer, invite Jesus into your heart, is not biblical because none of those phrases, none of those concepts appear anywhere in Scripture. And Scripture is our source and our guide. So Calvin was wrong in saying there's limited atonement because John says here quite plainly that Jesus is the atoning sacrifice. So there's that word again of atonement. Jesus is the atoning sacrifice, not for our sin only, that is the sin of those who believe in him and trust in him, but also for the sin of the whole world. So this is just a wonderful example of the wideness of God's mercy, God's grace and mercy, God's saving grace and love cannot be contained in any box of human construction. It cannot be contained by our narrow ideas of how God act, ought, ought to act or how we would act if we were sitting on God's throne because we would sure get after all those people we don't like. Um, but that's not what God is about. God is for us and he is for all people. Jesus died for us and for all people. And that is very, very good news. It's wonderful news, the best news I would say that the world has ever heard. Now, turning back uh, to the Gospel of John, let's look at John chapter eight. I'm getting there myself. I'm going to begin reading at verse one. Hear God's word to you. Then each of them went home while Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. So he's there to perform the daily prayers that were customary for Jews. All the people came to him and he sat down and began to teach them. This was characteristic of Jewish rabbis, by the way, that they sat while the people who were being taught, the people following the rabbi, or at least hanging around to hear what the rabbi had to say, stood around him. So that's what's happening here. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and making her stand before all of them. And uh, just quickly, I would note the uh, very lamentable sexism of this picture. It has been not something characteristic only of Jews, but also of Christians down through the centuries. Uh, the patriarchy, the uh, putting men at the center of all things, making men the measure of all things, insisting that well, because Jesus only had male disciples, that only males or only men can be priests or pastors. This is a lamentable record based on nothing in Scripture. Jesus, it is true, had only men among the original 12 who were his closest followers. But we also know from the Gospel record that he had many women followers, that it is in fact women followers who underwrote Jesus' own ministry financially, made it possible for him to be an itinerant preacher. Uh, he could leave the work of carpentry and take up the work of preaching and of proclaiming the kingdom of God because these women underwrote his ministry. We know that the same was true for the Apostle Paul, that it is women who underwrote his ministry. It is uh, women there were women that Paul identifies in his writings as apostles of Christ. Um, and uh, so it is not true that there were no, uh, there, there were only male apostles, and that's the, the uh, example that we ought to follow. But even more basic than who, who ought to be able to be ordained is that there's no punishment for the man who is involved in this adulterous relationship. He's not mentioned, and in fact, that was the practice. The woman was punished, 
and not the man. And that is just an example of sexism and patriarchy and one that thankfully we seem to be moving beyond. I say let's keep going until we're completely past that kind of behavior. Making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught red-handed, caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. And that's true. They're quoting from the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, which are called the books of Moses, though they were not actually written by Moses. They were written much later than Moses, but they encapsulate what Moses was about and the things that Moses taught, the things that Moses received from God and passed on to the people. And they said this to test him so that they might have some charge to bring against him. So here again is this dynamic of the scribes and Pharisees hoping to catch Jesus up so that they have some charge that they can hang on him, that he's either soft on sin or that he's just as harsh as they are or that he is uh, breaking the commandments of God by forgiving. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. I wonder what he was writing, don't you? Wouldn't it be interesting to know? Now, some theologians have suggested that Jesus was writing the words of the Ten Commandments, which include, of course, the commandment that you shall not commit adultery. Well, maybe that is true. It's conceivable. Um, it's also true that maybe Jesus was playing tic-tac-toe. In fact, John Calvin, who I've called wrong on one matter, I think was right on this matter in his commentary on the Gospel of John. He suggests that Jesus was simply doodling in the dust. He was, in other words, biding his time, waiting for these men to finish spitting out their accusations, venting their anger, and uh, you know, putting putting out their their hoped for hook to reel Jesus in. He's just waiting. And then what happens? They kept on questioning him. So he got tired of it. You know, it's like sometimes people just go on so long with their revenge schemes that you get tired of hearing about it, right? Maybe you're talking with somebody on the phone and for a time when they go on, you start playing tic-tac-toe on the notepad that's lying on the phone table. Or you just kind of doodle. You draw a little uh, cube or you uh, work on the uh, work on signing your name in a more stylish way. Something like that. It seems, though, that you can never reproduce that when you sign a check. At least that's what happens to me. But after a while, you know, you just get tired of hearing it. And I think that's what is happening here. Jesus just gets tired of hearing about these uh, revenge schemes. They kept on questioning him, so he straightened up. Now he's looking them eye to eye, and he says, Let anyone among you who was without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And it's interesting what happens. Then he goes back down to the ground to his knees or maybe sitting Indian style. I don't know. And he, but he's back doodling in the dust. Like, okay, so now I've answered you and I know you can't answer me, but I'm just going to bide my time and let you think about it because I think you're actually going to come to the right answer in this instance. When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. Interesting, isn't it? That rings true to our understanding of human nature, right? It's the older man. Again, it's just men making this accusation against this lone woman. Boy, they felt safe in numbers. 10, 20, 30 men against one woman. So the elders, the older men, who have perhaps a little more sense of their own mortality, their own frailty, um, they're not quite so full of themselves as they were, say, when they were young men, when they... And when they were young, they thought they had all the answers, and their zeal ran far ahead of their knowledge, just like mine did when I was a young theologian in my 20s. Boy, I thought I knew it all. thought I had the world by the tail. Whew, was I wrong. So that today, you know, I'm old enough to think that, well, the, the older I get, the less and less I am certain of. That tr was true 
of these scribes and Pharisees as well. The older men realize, wait a minute, we don't have a leg to stand on by this standard. Let anyone who is without sin cast the first stone. Well, that's not me. That's not you, Levi. That's not you, Baruch. And uh, it's the young men, the hotheads, the ones who are full of themselves, who are left standing there with their arms cocked, ready to cast the killing stone until in time they also realize, oh, geez, I'm not qualified either. And all the stones fall to the ground. All these angry, accusing men peel away silently until no one is left but Jesus and the woman. Jesus straightened up. So here it goes again. He looks her in the eye. And he said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Um, well, sir, actually 30 men condemned me. <laughs> but actually she says, No one, sir. You know, they've all headed for the hills. 